Hello, I'm Belinda Hawkins, one of the producers here at Australian Story. Tonight, part two of my program about the fate of Yoshe Taylor, whose friendship with a man called Precious Max ended in a Cambodian jail cell. Yoshe always claimed she was the victim of an online scam. Her plight went unnoticed until a chance meeting sparked the interest of a tenacious law graduate. And as you'll see, what happened to Yoshe Taylor also raises questions about the role Australian authorities played in her case. But first, a recap. Precious Max was living in Phnom Penh with his girlfriend Charlene Savarino, and both of them were part of an international drug syndicate who were operating to lure Australian men and women to travel to Cambodia to bring drugs back into Australia. I thought I got to know him and he seemed very nice. He knew I was looking for work. Precious Max asks Yoshe to work in Brisbane importing Cambodian arts and crafts. He was a gentleman who was very busy running several intimate relationships online at the same time. Welcome to Nome. I didn't know anything about Cambodia. The first night we were there, he proposed marriage to me. Just thought this was a dream come true. Kay arrives back in Melbourne. Unbeknownst to her, she proceeds through security, carrying uh, just over two kilos of heroin in her bag. On the last day of Yosho's third trip, Charlene provides her with a backpack containing Cambodian fabrics. A small Cambodian man called my name. He cut down the spine of the bag and that was when I saw the powder and it was heroin. I was charged with international drug smuggling and I had no idea what would happen. Shortly after she was arrested, Mum called us and it was really sad. She cried and it was just telling her that she loves us and she'll hope she, she sees us soon. And it was pretty sad, especially because we never got a call after that. I was put in a room with 99 women. It was about 15 metres by 5 metres. There were three toilets in a 2 metre by 1 metre space at one end. No wall, no curtains, no plumbing. After three weeks, I was moved to the police jurisdiction prison. It has the major headquarters of the police outside. It's only very small. The embassy gives you a list of lawyers and I didn't know who to ask for. It was just like you pull a lawyer out of your hat and hope that you've got one that will help you. What do you do in the front room? Sort the shoes out. I wonder if I could have stopped her from going over there, but I don't think she would have listened to me. You know. It's okay, sweetheart. I was a past, not the future. I'm not in any financial position to be able to um, get any sort of flights overseas, let alone hotels and, you know, all the other bits and pieces that are involved. Um, I couldn't do it for myself, let alone a family of three. I didn't know what would happen because we don't come from a family with money. My brother found someone who had experience with people who had been put in jails in foreign countries, Australians mostly, and he had helped them get home. I come from a security background. It was a contractual agreement, but at a very, very low cost because I had no idea what we could achieve. 
Over the next few months, like, Ross was there all the time and he helped me emotionally cope and he helped me physically with what I needed to, to survive. I did find out that uh, Australian Federal Police were working on this case directly with the Cambodian Transnational Police. And I knew that the two had, were working very close together and had been for, for some time. Ross found out that when they arrested Precious, they found another two kilos of heroin in his house and the purity was the exact same percentage as the heroin that was in my bag. And he found out the passport that I'd been sent was um, a fake passport. I was able to get a full police check, nationwide police check here in Australia, to verify that she had never been arrested, never had done any wrongdoing in the past. So all these things that I was obtaining just didn't fit. It didn't fit a profile of a person who was involved as a drug trafficker or a, you know, a consenting mule. But I'd only ever seen my lawyer once. Um, I didn't really know what to expect from court. You have to sit with the case partners and I didn't want to sit with them. Precious was supposed to be my friend. He never spoke clearly or out loud. He just whispered to his translator and the translator spoke. So I have no idea of what he said. Charlene was from a French Italian background, French national, 19 years of age. She tried to blame it all on me. She said that I had the bag for a couple of hours in between going to the airport and when she dropped it to me. And I was really lucky because the policeman who cut the bag open, he went up straight after her and he said that it was professionally sewn. It would have taken professional equipment and I didn't have that in my hotel room, that you couldn't tell with the naked eye that there was something inside it. So after all of that, I thought there was a chance that something good might come out of it. But Yoshe's initial lawyer wasn't very experienced at all. She would have needed a lawyer that was high profile, but she couldn't afford it. And this was a, this was a major problem. The verdict was in May 2014, and I had no translator. They just spoke, and then they wanted us to stamp a page and leave. I was like, I don't want us thumbprint, I don't know what's been said, I don't know what's going on. But they insisted and I thumbprinted. And then the embassy lady followed us down the stairs and she came up to me and told me that I'd gotten 23 years. Precious was given 27 years and Charlene was given 25 years. I did not want to spend 23 years away from my children. I felt like that it's just causing them pain, wanting, like hoping that I'm coming home and that they would be better off if I wasn't here anymore because at least then they could mourn and get over it. I actually thought the death penalty was a much better idea than being in jail for 23 years. Unfortunately, the financial situation for Yoshe's family had basically dried up. Uh, they couldn't support me being there any longer. So I came back home. And I stopped eating, not because I was on hunger strike, I wasn't. I stopped eating because I was, I couldn't eat. I didn't, I didn't feel hungry. I didn't feel 
anything. I just get, I had no hope. In early 2015, I received a brief for a woman named Kay. And it was a brief that involved bringing two kilos or so of um, heroin into Australia. After Kay was arrested, she was taken off to a women's prison. I spent six months in Dame Phyllis Frost Centre. That was the scariest experience I've ever had, being in jail, really unsure what my future held. I met her about a month before her case was to go to trial. Understandably, at that point, she was very anxious about how the case was going to unfold. I was looking at a long, you know, big trial, probably looking at 12 years in jail. I certainly felt that Kay had a good defence. She had no knowledge and no intention, but there is never a guarantee with a jury trial. In late March 2015, we received great news that the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions was not proceeding with the trial against Kay. It seemed that they realised all the evidence pointed to Kay being an innocent agent. She was a free woman. I was ecstatic. I just burst into tears. It makes me tear up just thinking about it. It gave me back my life. He might have taken my past, but I won't allow him to take my future. I won't allow Precious to steal what, any more of me. After Kay had gone on her way, usually what barristers do is they put a ribbon around the uh, brief and they send it back to the solicitor and they clear some way for some more folders on their shelf. But there was something about Kay's matter. I could not send it back to the solicitor. We had spent quite a bit of time, Kay and I, talking about Precious Max. And during those conversations, she told me uh, that she believed there was a woman by the name of Yoshe Ann Taylor who had been arrested attempting to leave Cambodia with almost the same amount of heroin. And she assumed that there was a connection with Precious Max. I kept thinking, surely I'm going to stumble across somebody in Queensland who's working on this woman's plight. Uh, there must be a bevy of lawyers working around the clock, but she had just fallen off the radar. In 2016, I was undertaking practical legal training after completing my law degree and I did it with Philip Dunn QC. In Luke's case, he, he was an enthusiast. He shattered me around the traps uh, from case to case. We would often have lunch together and this particular day, it just happened to be with another barrister called Moya O'Brien. Do you remember that case of Kay I was telling you about? the drug? She had these case. concerns that there may be this case in Cambodia that was related to the matter she had just worked on. And you think there's another one well, in the same category? Really, I didn't have anything other than Kay's case and an inkling to prove uh, that this woman was innocent. I've been meaning to try and do more research on it, but really, I, I just don't know where to start. As luck would have it, Luke told me that he'd also been an investigative journalist. Do, do a bit of dabbling. This conversation was one of those synchronistic events because a lot has happened since Luke first heard about that woman lost, alone and forgotten. When I originally got Kay Smith's brief and then I obtained Yoshe Taylor's prosecution, Cambodian prosecution documents, I was looking for similarities between the two briefs. Reading the Cambodian documents, I actually found a copy of Kay Smith's passport. 
her passport could only have come from the Australian authorities because Kay Smith was arrested in Australia. And that was my aha moment. There, it, was, it was unequivocal. Their, their two cases were absolutely linked. And to my horror, they were using Kay Smith's case to actually argue Yoshe was guilty, even though Kay Smith's case had already been discontinued. No one had ever updated the Cambodian authorities. Luke was text messaging me the very next day. He was so captured by this story. We both realised there were a number of striking similarities between Kay's case and Yoshe's case. The amounts of heroin were both around the two kilo amount. The manner in which it was secreted in the bags uh, was very similar. But there was something else. The Cambodian prosecution brief also contained the passport of an Australian man. We had no idea who this man was. Little did we know he was going to become a very important piece of the puzzle. I then needed to find out who's Yoshe Taylor, who is this woman? Was she tricked? Luke called me a few days later and he said, I'm going to Cambodia. I've booked tickets to Cambodia. I just couldn't believe the tenacity and courage that he showed leaving his child and partner at home and going off on this mission, which I actually perceived as quite dangerous. Two kilos of heroin is worth a lot of money. So my synopsis of the situation was that this was a powerful drug cartel that was operating out of Phnom Penh. I certainly didn't know what dangers there might be if they found out that he was visiting Yoshe in the prison. They brought Yoshe out and the first thing that struck me was she just lost an amazing amount of weight. So much so that she was almost unrecognisable. I'd been three years a mushroom by that stage. Luke seemed very sincere. He seemed to care. Um, he seemed to want to help. There was very much a penny drop moment when Luke discovered that the person that Yoshe had been speaking to and the person that Kay had been speaking to, not only were they both African men, they both had on their chest a tattoo of a lion. So we knew at that moment we had the same man. So we're going to Precious Max, where Precious Max was arrested, and this is where he lived. So a lot of the photos are online, they're taken inside this apartment building. It's a bit off the beaten track, so a bit nervous about heading down here. It's a dead end street. Yeah, so this is it. This is where he was arrested. We're being watched, so I reckon we bust, bust a move. What I needed from Yoshe was access to her online accounts. When I did a data dump from her Facebook, I was able to read not just the messages she was having between her, herself and Precious Max, but also the others, the friends that she'd, that, that she'd been discussing, the opportunities that Precious Max had been offering her. I went out to visit the addresses listed on the employment contract provided to Yoshe. Seal wash quarry, that's like right here. here. That's right here. Yeah. This is a, a, allegedly a showroom for a, a business, an art for KNN. In terms of employment, it says. So it says, like, you know, they're going to give her a job. So let's go take a look at it. Let's go have a look and see what's there. Looking at it globally, you were able to get a much better picture that the story that she was telling was, was truthful. Nothing really artsy about it. I told him at that point that there was another girl. I'd been told through the grapevine inside that this lady had been caught in Australia 
and that she'd been tricked by Precious, even though he was in jail. So I, I wanted someone to find out who she was. So we had another case of a young mother who was arrested in Australia, flying back from Cambodia, same amount of drugs. Her case was discontinued, as, as was Kay Smith's, in the same manner. I can recall taking a call from Luke when he was in Cambodia, and Luke told me there was another woman, and I started Googling the other woman. The mum of three, betrayed by the man she loved, he used her as an unsuspecting drug mule. They brought the case in and they started drilling it in front of me. White powder come out. And lo and behold, I came across a video from a TV interview this woman had done. And there was a picture flashed up on my screen of Precious Max with the lion tattoo. Him sitting with his shirt off, which is common in most of his photos. Um, he's a well-built guy, but in the background you can actually see the prison bars of Kendall Prison, where he is currently located and where he was operating from. Yoshe Taylor didn't have any Australian legal representation and that concerned me. This time the prosecutor mentioned that I could have been a victim. Um, he actually said Charlene and I could have been a victim. It seemed to go really well. I think the police really tried to do the right thing today in the hearing. But she lost. At that point, she was pretty desperate. And what do you think about people who might think that you're guilty? There's so many people who have been tricked. I'm not the only one to be tricked. So... I've found the situation to be absurd. Have you got a message to your family that you'd like to send to your family? I, I love you. <laughs> Late 2016, Luke arrived back in Melbourne and we realised we had to find Yoshe, an Australian lawyer, and we had to find one fast. When Moya asked whether I could assist in Yoshe's case, I was somewhat reluctant. The Bali Nine were arrested in Indonesia in 2005 after a tip-off from the Australian Federal Police. I was part of a legal team trying to assist Andrew Chan and Myron Sukumaran on their final appeal against the death penalty. The families of Myron Sukumaran and Andrew Chan are tonight mourning their deaths. And that case took an incredible toll on me uh, personally. But I ultimately agreed to assist Yoshe Taylor. In the time between when Myron and Andrew were executed and when Moya rang me in late 2016, I myself had had a daughter and I could not imagine what Yoshe must be going through being separated from her two children. She was going to work for free because I didn't have any money and um, I knew I needed help. We were really facing an incredibly difficult task to try and convince the court that Yoshe really did not know the drugs were in that bag. The turning point in the case came when we found out who the male was that was in Yoshe's prosecution dossier. He had come into Australia from Cambodia with two kilos of heroin. He had no knowledge of the drugs that were hidden uh, in his bag and uh, no intention to bring those drugs into Australia. That male had been tricked into travelling to Cambodia by Charlene Savarino. She was operating the exact same scam as Precious Max was with the Australian females. She was operating with Australian men. The man who was drawn into this whole web wasn't as lucky as Kay. He had to stand trial. Uh, fortunately for him, he was ultimately found not guilty by a jury. What that case showed us was that Charlene Savarino had been operating at the same level as Precious Max 
and this was completely contrary to what she had been telling authorities throughout the trial, that she had been tricked and did not know that the drugs were within that bag. So in Australia, we'd had a situation where one case had been discontinued in Melbourne, that's Kay Smith. A man had been found not guilty and a third young single mother of three had also been discovered and had her case discontinued. And she'd also provided a long statement to the Australian Federal Police, detailed statement. Um, so they were aware it was the same guy, Precious Max. Yet nothing got back to Cambodia. They were never updated as to the status of those three Australian cases. It's unfortunate that that information wasn't provided to Yoshe and her lawyers as soon as it was available because it could have avoided her staying in that prison. Which, in my view, is, sh is shocking. You know, I don't understand it. I really don't understand. Because, they've, you know, they had a liaison officer there in Phnom Penh. The Australian authorities, including the federal police, will not intervene in cases in foreign countries, even though it may be the information they've provided that has seen an Australian be arrested. I am worried that Perhaps their conduct has put an innocent woman in great danger. Supreme Court is the last day because she's charged with the drug case. There is a um, slight chance uh, of success. Alex Wilson had engaged a new local lawyer. You've got no knowledge of, of, a, of a conviction? Yeah, quashed, yeah. From, from my knowledge, I, I cannot see any uh, uh, yeah. return of that. Yeah. And they prepared an appeal based primarily on the ev new evidence that had been discovered. In June 2018, Yosho's appeal to the Supreme Court, which is the highest court in Cambodia, heard her case. And ultimately, the court found that there was not enough evidence to prove that Yosho had knowledge that the drugs were in the bag. And the court quashed her conviction. She'd won, and uh, it floored me, actually. I was absolutely floored but I knew that it wasn't over. The Supreme Court remitted her case back to the Court of Appeal. Everyone was saying to me, you're going to go home. By this stage, though, I was not wanting to have hope. I was looking at worst case scenarios. I was making plans about what would happen if they did the sentence again, which were not very nice plans. I'm heading over on uh, Tuesday and the hearing's Friday. There's a lot of uncertainty around what's going to happen. Well, I mean, here we are again. Yeah. I'm so really scared that she's just going to end up being there for the next, like, 20 years of my life, where we don't get to see her and talk to her and she's alone and stuff. I'll keep you updated. Look, um, man, I can't really say to you clearly how much I appreciate everything you've been doing. No, mate, don't worry about it. This will be my sixth time to Cambodia. It's not a place that I've enjoyed being in. It's exhausting. But at the same time, I feel that I owe it to Yoshe to see her receive some form of justice. The day before Yoshe's hearing, she's really anxious about tomorrow. She doesn't know what's happening. I think she's afraid that this is the end, in a sense. This is the end of, she may end up being there for a, a lot of years. On the 19th of April, we had the verdict for the reappeal and I had to stand up out the front again and they talked about all the evidence. 
my translator kept saying the word tricksters. And then the judge said that the prosecutor had written a letter saying that he also supported the judges looking at a not guilty charge. And I was very conflicted. I was, kept feeling my hopes rising, kept trying to quash it down. Just wait, just wait. Don't, don't. You might misunderstand. You might be misunderstanding. And then he said that I was not guilty and free. <laughs> free. And did I have anything to say? And I said, Akonjuran, which means thank you. <laughs> I'm very happy uh, that um, finally uh, everybody knows that she's innocent and the court in Cambodia um, also understand that she's innocent. I've got good news for you. Your mum won today. So anyway, she's coming home. Pretty soon. Really soon. And your mum's like over the moon. Really happy want to just like no mention of it on the internet and stuff till she's actually out of the country. Um, don't want to upset the apple cart over here. All right, take care and I'll chat to you again before I leave. And for you too. I'm happy about it but I'm also worried about, you know, how she'll take how the world's changed still. <laughs> it's just... Even if we don't know how long it'll take, it's good to know she'll be back soon. In May, I received the best text message I've ever received in my life. I was sent a photo by the Cambodian lawyer of both Yoshe and him standing outside the prison. She'd finally been released. Shortly thereafter, I received a series of photographs showing Yoshe at the airport, about to board the plane. And I knew we'd won. After all these years of work, she was finally free, and she was going to return home to see her two children. And that was the greatest victory I've ever had in any case and I think it probably will be the greatest victory I ever have. Without the intervention of a law student and lawyers, this woman would rot and die in jail. It shouldn't be a chance conversation that leads to somebody being helped. And it's in a way sad that we have to call upon lawyers to do it for nothing. And we shouldn't abandon our citizens. My dream, like what I really want to happen is we just live normally, I guess. Just live like how everyone else does. I've got to <laughs> do some things for you. I knew for Yoshe, returning to Australia would be the most amazing thing for her to be reunited with her children. But I also knew that this was going to be an incredibly difficult time for her. She doesn't have a house anymore. Her children have grown up without her being around and she now needs to rebuild all those bridges and find her place. I have heard people talk about Australians as being easy to scam and I don't want us to become scared but I want us to be able to protect ourselves have some empathy for people who are in situations that we can't really imagine unless you've been there. If one person is, is protected because they've seen the story of myself, 
Like, if it can save one other Australian, I'll be really happy.